I now am second guessing myself constantly now that I know how important all that stuff is. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, if I don't get the title or the thumbnail or the intro right, this could be the difference between 30,000 and, you know, 3 million views. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. I, I feel like this will be the most pivotal year in CTWC history. And so I pulled an all-nighter that night and got it up. And Eric decided to go to bed in the middle of the night. And that was the difference between who uploaded the video first. 2024 might be the biggest year in NES Tetris. And my guest today had a major part in it. He created the explain video for the Blue Scooty Game Crash. He created all the videos for the Pixel Any Game Crash, Fractal Game Crash, and with Alex T World Record Shattering Run. He also created a video for that. So five major videos already in 2024. He also has the explain video for rolling, which got viral in 2022, and is the original NES Tetris YouTube content creator. I'm talking about a Game Scout. Hi, my name is Frank, also known as Sir Mesa. Welcome to the Series 4 finale of the Peace Dependency Podcast. Like I said, Game Scout on the show. We talked about CTWC going to Pasadena in 2024. Game Scout now being a max outer. And the creation of the Blue Scooter Game Crash video. What happened there? What are the secrets? Also, when I researched the video, I came across that GameScout teamed up with Jazz Steve during the 2019 Mind Melt uh, side events during CTWC. So I want to give a quick shout out to Jazz Steve. Hope to see you in November during the Open Championships. With that all being said, this is our conversation. Game Scout, welcome back to the Peace Dependency Podcast, and thank you so much for doing this. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. It's good to be back. Even though it was only a few years ago that I was first on this, it feels like a lifetime in Tetris years. Well, that's a pandemic. We were in the midst of the pandemic, and that is four years ago. And sometimes I wonder, like, that is four years ago. So it's like, oh my gosh, that's so, <laughs> that's so long ago. <laughs> Well, a lot yeah. happened. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, a, a lot happened between the last time we spoke, late 2020, and right now. But and I want to get to a lot of it. But first of all, you're a max outer. Yes, I am. Finally, <laughs> when I started playing, I think there were only about 25 people who had done it, and then by the time I got it, there were 500. So it wasn't <laughs> quite as elite, but. It makes me satisfied that at least something that seemed like a very unattainable, almost impossible goal when I started out, I was able to eventually do it. Yeah. Which I think is the way for a lot of people when they start playing. They may not anticipate that they'll ever max out, but uh, it was, yeah, really satisfying to eventually get there. I think you, along with Kingsman, uh, were a few of the widely known community members that, that finally got that max out. And I think the only one left is Fendi. We're waiting for yes, his max out. Yeah, he's getting close. Uh, he, he definitely has the potential to get there. I think his personal best is in the 800 Ks. And once you get up to the mid 700 Ks, you know, you have the ability to Tetris on 19. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. The big thing that's, finally allowed me to get it was just realizing that 90 percent of my training needs to be on 19 you know i can't yeah. just be playing 18 even though that's fun to relax and just start a game from the beginning you have to train yourself for the hardest part um, and that way you'll be prepared to eventually do the hardest part when it comes <laughs> when the moment comes and was it a lot of online uh grinding or did you train a lot of offline I played Transition Trainer a bunch uh, offline. That was basically exclusively offline because 
it's a really great tool for learning how to pace yourself and mentally handle the stress that comes when you're really close to a max out. And it comes down to just whether you'll get the final Tetrises or not. Sometimes the RNG will work out. Sometimes you can get screwed. So by the time I was ready to get my real max out, I had already gotten so many, you know, transition trainer max outs and then also near misses. So I felt like I had mentally gone through every possible success and failure point that I could have. So if I got a failure point going for my first max out, I'd be like, okay, you know, this happens. I don't need to be bummed about it. I can just do it again. Yeah. And then when I played 18, I only did it online because I just wanted to avoid, unfortunately, <laughs> what happened to Kingsman, where he just sat down yeah. on Thanksgiving Day, I think, just waiting for the food to be ready and then got a max out offline. Yeah. The max out grinds on Remember Late, late 2022. Like you got a 900K uh, late 2021, and then it's close to a year between your first 900K and then your max out. It's like you get. Don't think you had that one-off, like Grand Designs had that one-off uh, uh, near max out. I think your PB was 940 uh, before before you got the max out. It's like, it's it's kind of a blessing that you don't have that one-off. Yes, uh, I am glad in retrospect that I did not experience that in a real game. I experienced it so many times on Transition Trainer, which was frustrating enough. <laughs> And I I really do think that the transition trainer training was what helped me mentally when I finally did get the max out because I, I didn't get it through some amazing 19 efficient play. I got it off literally my highest 18 transition ever. It was like a 640K. It was just a matter of not choking. Yeah. And so even though I was, you know, it was a situation where maybe if I hadn't had all those transition trainer games, I would have been super stressed. But <laughs> It allowed me to stay focused in the moment. Was it also you got the max out and then, okay, let's dial a little bit back on playing NES Tetris and focus more on content creation and and helping the backside of the community? Yeah, yeah. So when I started playing NES Tetris, I really didn't know what my long-term goal was. I think very early on I had aspirations of being a top player back when the barrier wasn't quite so high. You know, it only took a mid 500K <laughs> to get into the CTWC gold bracket. And very quickly, I realized I just couldn't keep up with the pace of all the new generation coming in and learning all these techniques and just figuring it out way faster than I could. So after getting a max out, I realized, yeah, I mean, I could try and learn rolling. I could get a roll max, but... I've seen so many other people be able to contribute their talents to the scene in other ways than just playing Tetris, either as behind the scenes organizers, making incredible software, running Discord servers, running tournaments, running everything. And the thing I've been passionate about, you know, for 15 years was making YouTube videos. And so it felt like that was the thing that made sense for me to focus on. Yeah. So speaking speaking of YouTube, uh, you had your big success like earlier this year with with the Blue Scooty uh, game crash. But the first really viral video we talked about a diverse podcast that was um, what is classic Tetris. It got like I'm still surprised that that video hasn't got a million like seven hundred fifty ish k uh, views on that. But l- like when you explained the rolling technique and when the world uh, outside of our outside of our community got to know the rolling technique for the first time. That was really your first viral video. Uh, how do you look back on that? Yeah, so I think the thing I have realized about YouTube that I did not realize several years ago, I feel like I've learned, it, it, despite having created YouTube videos for so long, And feeling like I finally understood it multiple times, it was really the past couple years and especially the past couple months where I realized how much I still have to learn and that you can know all the surface level stuff. You can know editing, you can know presentation, you can know production values. That's all well and good and important. But if you don't understand 
the underlying fundamentals of like connecting with an audience and story, then your videos won't do as well as they could have. They might do okay, but they could be better. And that was something that I feel like I finally understood when I would see other YouTubers do things that I saw worked and try and emulate them on a surface level, but not really understand why they did them. Yeah. So I look back at some of my earliest videos and they did well on the surface, but they could have been so much better. Uh, <laughs> and I feel like that's the way you want to be. You never want to be in just a stagnant spot. You want to be able to look back at your older stuff and be like, okay, I could have done it better now. <laughs> but yeah, I, I I have not watched that very first video CTWC explained in a long time. I would probably cringe too hard at it. <laughs> but I think the thing I realized was, especially with Tetris, it's not about explaining everything in an entertaining way. I thought that's what my goal should be at the beginning is just, oh my gosh, I have all this knowledge of Tetris that I've learned from watching the Twitch streams, watching YouTube videos. I need to just explain it in a cool, entertaining way. The problem was I was just explaining way too much and stuff that wasn't even necessary. Yeah. The way to connect with an audience is to give them a reason to care, not a just an, you know, a college lecture. Um, the story is really what's most important. It's the reason why we all connected with the CTWC, with the players in the first place. We found people to root for. We found people that we wanted to succeed. Yeah. And so I think that's what I've realized in more recent videos where I try and focus on that, only explaining the bare minimum instead of trying to explain everything and instead focusing on the people. Is that what you learned before you made a Blue Scooty video or was that still after you made that video? It's like, okay, now I have to really focus on that. Yeah, so the thing I realized is that uh, it's it's good to have just kind of a central narrative that can be followed. So like the CTWC explained, it's just kind of all over the place. I'm explaining this thing. I'm explaining that thing. With the Blue Scooty video, uh, I mean, that, that video worked for just a, a whole host of very lucky reasons. It was kind of the culmination of a bunch of viral hits that had happened in the past, some on my channel, some on other channels. Uh, like the rolling video previously had done well on my channel. That was like a two minute segment of that video. Greg Cannon's AI video for Stack Rabbit that had also done very well on his channel. It was like a two section, two minute section of the Blue Scooty um, video. Yeah. But yeah, it was, I think, focusing on one specific thing. So yeah. it wasn't even necessarily Blue Scooty, who I do focus on. Like, there's a lot of different players. The thing I realized was if I want a huge wide audience to understand this, I cannot get bogged down in the details. I don't want to focus True. on score. I don't even want to focus on lines. The only thing I focused on was the level world record, which most people in the community don't even do. They track it by lines. But I was like, all right, this is the most simple way I can possibly think of to explain how we got here. Um, so that was the narrative choice I decided to make with the video is like, all right, what was the progression of the level world record? And what were the steps that it took to get there? Yeah. But you had a, a, a viral video in the past, the Pi song over on the Song Scout. In what way is creating a an, an idea of like playing piano based on the numbers of Pi and going viral with that and then several years later you're creating like now multiple million viewed videos on youtube like what is the difference between those two yeah so um <laughs> it's it's actually it's it's quite gratifying that i was able to finally do something that did better than the pie song because <laughs> i didn't want you know I, I am so grateful again for how well that video did, but I didn't want something that, you know, I created it, you know, uh, you know, in my, te in my teenage years to forever be the most successful thing I did on YouTube. Uh, I think the big difference of that was, I mean, I got fortunate that my Pi song was kind of the first one to really blow up. There's, 
you know, a huge first mover advantage on YouTube. I wasn't the first one to make a pie song, but I was the first one to have it really take off in the YouTube algorithm in the post 2015 era. It was all about like clicks and watch time and stuff. So that did very, very well. Uh, but the big thing I realized about the difference between having a one off like that and having, you know, four of my past five videos go crazy on YouTube is having a reason for people to stick around. Yeah. Uh, YouTube nowadays is very much centered around you want people when they watch your video, not just to enjoy it, but also want to anticipate something in the future. So with that pie song, I made it. And then people who subscribed off of that, what they're going to want is just more stuff like that numbers music. And I only ever made one more and there were going to be a limited amount of those I could make. I made a whole bunch of other stuff on that channel. Some of it did well and a lot of it didn't do that well, but it made sense because the best YouTube performing channels now have kind of a very focused thing. You want your audience to be interested in watching every single video. Yeah. So with the blue Scooty video, I mean, there's so many things that were just very fortuitous that worked out about it. But I think the biggest one that I'm just so glad that I just sort of lucked into thinking that it would be a good thing to focus on is the level 255 thing at mm -hmm. the end. Because it had been mentioned in the past that, uh, you know, this is a, this is a barrier that exists, but it was almost an afterthought uh, because we were like, no one's ever going to get there. That's yeah. just, you know, high in the sky. You know, even getting to Game Crash was a fantasy several years ago. Uh, I think Eric's video that he made just eight months ago, um, the whole history of classic Tetris World Records, at the very end, I went back and checked recently. He said he predicted it would be years before we'd see anyone get close to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was just, again, more of an afterthought. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, you know, there's this very, very far off thing. Maybe we'll see it someday, but who yeah. knows? Uh, but, in my video, I was like, I want to hype this up. I want to make it sound cool and almost magical even. And I had this like, you know, vision of a way to, I, 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 you know, I had this vision of a player and a Tetris, you know, anthropomorphic T piece, just reaching the light at the end of the tunnel and kind of built a whole, drawings and vision of how that was all going to be around that yeah. and it was just sort of like planning a flag of saying like this is where we're going next and i think it it, it worked out people loved it people wanted to see players go for it and so they didn't just have a reason to watch the video they had a reason to go to all these players you know channels and twitch streams and stuff and be like oh i want to see what happens next i want to see the journey to get there yeah it's been really blowing up lately with the live streams and especially with alexi now going for rebirth um and you said that like 255 um is, is the end goal and and when i saw the blue scooty uh, video or, or when i knew that pixelandy got to level 180 uh yeah 100 level 148 like okay 255 it's still over 100 levels before we reach that and now it's like it can happen right now it can happen next week it can happen you know it's like it's so close and and if you said this like in i think if you would say this during cjwc in 2023 that we got a game crash that we will have 60 million points uh, world record and potentially rebirth in 2024, everyone would call you nuts. It's like, that's way too crazy. Even with the progression rolling has made, that is way too crazy of a prediction. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the craziest thing to me is, which is also just very cool, is that there's so many things that weren't even in the public consciousness or even the wider Tetris community consciousness a couple years ago. I think the example you gave right there of telling somebody a year ago, uh, you know, rebirth might be happening in a couple in, in a year. Uh, their, their first reaction would probably just be, what even is that? 
because the term didn't <laughs> exist back then. <laughs> um, and that was something where I, I it, it was very unintentional on my part to make the what has become the most commonly used name for it. But it just kind of w- worked out in that I was thinking like, all right, what's the opposite of like kill screen? You know, it'd be being reborn, rebirth. And it, it felt like a better thing to call it in the video than what I had previously seen, which was just kind of like the level rollover or the wraparound. Yeah. Um, and it, it ended up being a term that people liked, which is is cool. Um, sometimes it's like, I've seen that happen a lot in the past where like all the glitch color names didn't have, uh, it didn't exist either until Greg Cannon made his stack rabbit video and just assigned all these like really funny or really accurate or really iconic yeah. names to all these levels and now we have like oh my gosh there's dusk there's charcoal there's <laughs> you know green they're all coming up and they're like they all have their own personalities to look forward to yeah but so let's let's rewind it all the way back you made the video about rolling like and on the podcast we had multiple people who told the story of how they discovered rolling and you mentioned that she's uh invented the rolling play style invited a group into a secret group uh chat where he learned it and and the rest is history but how did you learn about rolling and how did you knew that this is something you need to keep an eye on and how did you start making that video yeah, so the way I found out about rolling was I saw that WPL match where she's got four Tetrises on kill screen, uh, you know, post 29, uh, as it's probably better to call it now. And that was something I'd never seen before, uh, you know, the peace movement. And so I was like, I got to figure out how he's doing this. And that was just after. I think the Rolling Realm channel had been created in the CTM Discord server. And there's just finally some public information that was out there. The only video of the technique was just that, uh, you know, five second video from Cheese that has now been used uh, in YouTube videos probably a billion times. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, it was just like, it was breaking news because Cheese wanted to keep it on the down low for a while so that he could surprise the community. But then people were starting to get really close to figuring it out. So he figured that the cat was out of the bag and just let people know about it. And it was just one of those moments where I was like, this is the biggest story I've ever seen in Tetris. I need to make a video on this immediately. Yeah. And so I just churned down something in a week. And <laughs> yeah, it, it, I mean, it, it ended up being not just a big story for Tetris, but for people outside of Tetris, that was the biggest surprise I had. But I also look back at that video, and it's another example of video where I'm like, I could have done that video so much better. <laughs> because I I look at the watch time on that video, people watch about two thirds of it, and then they just stop. Because at the yeah. end, there's just a bunch of random info dumping. And that's, again, where it gets back to like, you know, You'd have the technical knowledge of how to make a video, but unless you craft a narrative that lands all the way to the end and give people something specific to look forward to in the future, they're not going to stick around. Yeah. So how did you do your research? That Did you ask cues? Did you ask other players who you found out that they were uh, learning the rolling technique? Uh, yeah, I am... Um, I... I think the main thing was I just back read the entire Rolling Realm uh, channel. And at some point, I did eventually get added to that original group chat that she's had. I think it was after I made the video. Uh, But oftentimes, the the best research that I can do is just literally just trawling through the CTM Discord (laughs) server and just back reading everything. Because it's it's a way to see like when really pivotal things happen in the community, they just happen out in the open on a Discord channel with people just discussing it. Yeah, that was eventually how I did the research for the Blue Scooty video about the game crash and the crash dodge document. I didn't end up actually asking anybody where where that was. I just <laughs> back read in the Discord channel and found it. I was like, oh my gosh, this is cool. So it's a similar process for the rolling video. It's like typing in a search bar, 
looking for keywords and then scrolling back up. Yeah, yeah. In the same way, like Google Foo is referred to as like, you know, a skill to have in the internet age. Yeah. Where you just know how to find stuff on Google by searching. I feel like it's a similar way for Tetris historians <laughs> knowing where to search in the Discord servers. Uh, was it lucky that uh, I think later that year you went to the South Carolina uh, qualifier and I think Richie was there? Uh, playing rolling for the first time um, and you made another video about it though almost a year later but it's like you made a video about it and that went that went really great like keeping continuing on that same storyline this is rolling this is rolling for the first time uh, in live action yeah that video has almost 3 million views which I was never expecting and that video is probably the biggest example of how just um, <laughs> uh, uh, an optimized title and thumbnail makes literally all the difference in the world because uh, Richie, um, you know, the rolling technique was still very new at the time. Uh, Richie, a.k.a. Ruins, was not at his full potential at rolling yet like he was in CTWC. He was still quite rusty with it. Um, or inconsistent, maybe, is the better word. Like, the fact that he was rolling at all was cool, but he wasn't able to do much with it in that <laughs> tournament. But the fact that I just said the debut of rolling in the title, you know, was the difference between my previous in real life vlog, which got 30,000 views versus that one, which got, I think, uh, yeah, almost 100 times more views. Well, it was technically because South Carolina was the first live event after after the pandemic. So it's a cool yes, achievement it, to have. Absolutely, absolutely. And it, it makes it, it made me realize that like when I was thinking about how to make videos about in person events, it it was kind of like the way for it to do well on YouTube is not to just make a video about the event <laughs> and everything that happened. That's that's one step of it, but you have to have some reason for people to care about that event specifically, and it has to be something that they can latch onto with context with with almost no context. Like they have to just immediately be on board. Yeah, and so that was kind of what I realized about the CTWC experience videos I did. Because the first one I did on the surface, it looks like a success. It got half a million views. But I look back at the video and I was like, that video was kind of a failure, uh, at least as far as getting views. I mean, ob obviously, I'm really grateful for the success it did have and the reception people gave for me over the years. But yeah, it also came out at the perfect time for Tetris on the algorithm and the post Joseph ways. It got a ridiculous amount of impressions and the click through rate was horrible it could have gotten so many more views for the amount of impressions it did but oh, yeah. i didn't have a great hook for it other than myself and that was <laughs> another big thing i realized over the years is the less i focus on myself the better because i am often the most boring part of all these things i thought you know having a first person point of view would be cool yeah but eventually i realized you know it if I wasn't the one making the video, somebody making a video about this event would would never talk about me, or I'd just yeah. be a background character. Um, it makes the more makes the most sense to focus on a story, and that's what I eventually did with this CTWC experience video. I made it less about me and more about the story of Joseph, and, yeah, because that's the most compelling part. But I didn't have that right in the title and thumbnail because that would be a spoiler, so that was tough. But, but is, it's is yeah. it also like it came out on like you said the perfect time we had the uh, Joseph Jonas finals in in 2018. Uh, you were there. The there was not a lot of NES Tetris content on YouTube except for uh, Jonas videos, CTWC videos, like maybe the occasional Joseph video where he got a a new record or something like that. But not really an explain video or um, a story-wise documentary or whatever you want to call it. It's like, but if you look b back at it, you, you look at it with two 
like you said, with two different emotions, like it did really great, but it could have been so much better. Yeah, 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 I think so. And, and I think that's that's the perspective w w where I'm coming with, where I I am not trying to say in retrospect, like, oh, you know, half a million views, that sucks. But just sort <laughs> of like viewing it through the new lens of like, I, I'm trying to understand so much more how to make these videos the best they possibly can, because I want people to not only be on board right away, but also really connect. And so even if that video did really well with connecting the people who eventually did come on board, if it wasn't able to get, you know, 99% of people on board in the first place, well, then that part at the beginning was not, yeah. was, was in, in that specific limited context of failure. Um, and so I want to do better on that, basically. Uh, you know, and that was what, or the the biggest example of that for me was actually the reframing I did for the CTWC 2022 experience video where I put it out originally. I was like, okay, the people that I've had subscribed have seen these videos I've done in the past for CTWC 2018, 2019. I need to just do that exact same title and thumbnail format. And hopefully those re returning viewers will come back. That video was a complete flop uh, outside of the Tetris community. Uh, I got like 30,000 views on it from people in Tetris community, and people were really, really kind and nice in their response to it. But nobody on the greater YouTube algorithm was clicking on it. Yeah. Uh, it was just bad. And the only thing that needed to be changed was the title and thumbnail. Because my experience at CTWC 2022. The random person doesn't know who I am. The random yeah. person doesn't care. What they want is a reason to care about this tournament. And so I thought, I was like, all right, what was the angle that made the most sense? Well, it was kind of the year that the CTWC had to change forever because the players, you know, played so far, they broke the concept of going for pace. <laughs> yeah. And I had already talked about all of that in the video. It wasn't going to be clickbait if I put that in the title. So I was like, okay, just change the title. This is no longer CTWC 2020 three experience or 2022 experience it's how the 2022 world championships changed classic Tetris forever and then you know the players broke the game much simpler yeah. title and thumbnail and then it just blew up from there it was just a matter of changing the title and thumbnail and that was kind of like the lesson i should have learned from that south carolina video that i needed to do that every time <laughs> basically you know instead of just my experience at the south carolina tetris regional championship that would have been a flop so it's it's a difficult balance then to make a video about uh, classic Tetris, NES Tetris, while you want to have as much new viewers uh, uh, as you potentially get, but also maintain the casual viewers, like who watch uh, NES Tetris on YouTube, uh, uh, maybe the VODs for uh, monthly Tetris, or watching the single uh, match uh, videos. But also um, trying to maintain the hardcore, like the true community members who are in in the discords and playing the tournaments, and it's it's a difficult balance to have have them all uh, watching your videos. Yeah, for sure, and it does it does creep up on me that like the hard part about trying to optimize my videos for new viewers as much as possible is that oftentimes I'll be repeating, you know, the same basic information as much as uh, necessary. So, you know, occasionally I'll get a comment saying like, you don't have to explain rolling or how Tetris works for the hundredth time. And I totally get it. But I also keep in the back of my mind that like, you know, we're still in an era where Tetris is booming. Yeah. And if I have a video take off in the algorithm, the majority of those viewers are going to be completely new. And so that context ends up being really helpful. And so hopefully the returning viewers are willing to stick around just long enough to get past the basic information that I have to lay down for people to have the context. Yeah. And I do try and switch it up. So I am not just like repeating the same exact clips or exact wording every single time. It helps then if you go to CTWC every, every year. So you have to... Brand new B-roll for, for the next year. 
Yes, yes. So that's one thing that has also just really helped about going to events over the years is just being able to have built up this huge library of stock footage, even if I haven't ended up making a video about every single event, despite having wanted to, I at least have a bunch of footage. And the video that's coming out next, it'll be out by the time this podcast is up, is kind of the culmination of just me taking all my B-roll and just like <laughs> putting it out there. Um, and yeah, I also, it's been really gratifying to take photos of every event as well. It's, that's one way I've tried to contribute to the community and it's been really cool to see people use them. I think you're one of the people that uses them the most. And it's always awesome to see you take the photos I've done and make these like really cool graphics and yeah. everything with them. I uh, use it's, them in thumbnails and everything. Yeah, it's I'm so <laughs> I'm so grateful for that because I use them for the podcast uh, thumbnails. I use them for the World Tetris Ranking uh, posts I make on on the Piece of Penalty podcast, Instagram, and socials. It's like that. It gives. I like HD, like high quality photos, and it's better than having a screen grab from a funky. Uh, a Twitch stream uh, <laughs> and all that, and basically most the, the the elite Tetris players are going to live events, so it's it's yeah, it's it's I try to mix it up too, like trying to, to get the recent events and, and and all that, but it's really helpful, and thank you a lot for yeah. for for doing that. But it photography, that's like it, it, was it the same passion that you have for for making photos that you have for making uh youtube videos yeah so it was a passion that i got over time just once i got a dslr camera just you know shooting random stuff and eventually it becoming a significant part of what i do for my day job and the albums that the ctwc would put out every year on facebook where they'd have an official photographer and there'd be these super nice photos of everybody. I would attend these regional events and I was like, and it'd be really cool if there were nice photos of these regional events too. Yeah. Uh, and so I just started doing it at every event I went to just trying to take the best photos possible so that there would be nice photos of the event for the organizers and for the players and that they could be used. Cause a lot of players don't go to CTWC. You only see them at the region. Yeah. So it's, it's an opportunity to have, yeah, not, not only more pictures and more players, but also pictures of players in lots of different contexts too. Yeah. So is it, is it, do you try to, uh, outside of your day job and, and with regional events or CTWC, are you trying photographing different things like go outside? Uh, Man, I wish I could go outside more in between all the editing. <laughs> uh, uh, but but yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Ona and I, uh, one of the very first dates we went on was a photography date where we just went to you know a local park and then a local uh, you know atrium and took photos of each other and stuff. So that's cool. It was it was a part of our relationship early on. So yeah, to, I mean, taking photos is fun. It's nice to be able to preserve the memories. Yeah, and making a lot of photos essentially helps with improving the qualities of the photos. Yeah, yeah, um, and not not even necessarily uh, on a quality level, but just sort of realizing where to be and where to where to go. Because uh, the the most important part of getting a photo is just being at the right place at the right time. Oftentimes. Yeah. Uh, like uh, it's it, the the easiest photos to get are of people playing because they're usually just sitting in one spot and they don't move. It's it's very ideal for taking a photo, <laughs> but uh, for taking a photo of somebody winning or jumping up after they've won, you know, you have a very limited window in which you can get that. Uh, yeah. You know, triumphant photo or the players hugging or something. That's uh, very difficult to get. Uh, so you just always have to be on guard and prepared for those moments that are 
the, the action shots. I mean, I can see you running around uh, during during the matches. The scout is here, scout is there, and then you run around, <laughs> run around taking pictures everywhere. Yeah, yeah, basically, because uh, oftentimes uh, to get the optimal angle, I have to be on one side to get one player, and then I'll just have to run around for the whole other side <laughs> to to get the other one. But uh, yeah, is is it difficult with lightning? Like the CTWC is obviously well well lit, but regional events is mostly like convention lighting uh very bright uh and and not a lot of room for optimal photos i i presume yeah uh it's very funny actually in, in for recent events it's almost been exactly the opposite uh regional events are typically it, 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 i mean most of them are in conventions and very oftentimes conventions will just have everything lit up because it makes sense. You want all the people to see the vendors and everything. So uh, the recent events I've been to, Waco, Phoenix, everything else, those rooms have been well lit. The room that was not well lit was CTWC <laughs> last year. It was pitch black on the first day. Oh my. And that was actually kind of intentional by the organizers. I think it was requested by Vince. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Uh, so I might be wrong on that. But basically, it was very, very dark. And... What that meant was one, I I've had the same camera for a long time. I've needed to upgrade, but that's that's a big challenge just on a, an ISO level with yeah. basically avoiding lots of grain. So very fortunately, over the past year, Adobe has come out with a lot of great AI tools. You know, AI can be a mixed bag, but as far as repairing uh, noise and grain, it's yeah. really really phenomenal and has. Uh, it, it basically saved about half the photos that I took at CTWC last year from looking oh, significantly cool. worse. Tom Scott uh, posted a video a couple of years ago when, well, we were in pandemic and it was in front of a green screen that black in movies or videos is terrible. How is it with photos? Like, is black as terrible as it is with with videos? Uh, it's It's not as bad fortunately because it's it's easier to repair something that's a still rather than in motion but yeah i mean you just need to have a a, a good enough camera and the the hard thing is the motion shots because you can compensate for low light by just having the exposure of the photo be longer yeah you know and and oftentimes that's what you have to do anyway for crt photos because you, if if the shutter speed is too high, then you'll only see a tiny portion of the CRT. That's something that you learn very quickly when shooting any <laughs> regional photos is that you need to have a 130 or 160th shutter speed yeah. when shooting a CRT, which is pretty low. So you cannot shoot action shots at that or else it'll just look super blurry. <laughs> but action shots in a dark setting uh, you're going to have real problems with the grain, which is, th those are the photos that were rescued last year by yeah. the uh, AI noise is ones where I was trying to get players jumping up and down and they're doing it in darkness. And, you know, that's, uh, it's it's hard enough just getting the shot, you know, framed up and in focus, but also worrying about like, oh my gosh, my shutter speed, it needs to be high enough that they're not blurry, but also low enough that it's not just going to be garbled noise. Yeah. So it was, it was a balancing act last year at CTWC for sure but ultimately i did actually really like the lighting because it made some really beautiful dynamic shots especially on that first day um just where you see just the ring lights is the only thing illuminating the players and you just see like the purple lights in the background on the walls and it's just really cool yeah so is it something that you discuss with vince like how is the room in pasadena uh, what are the opportunities for me to take photos uh, what is the schedule like uh, for me? Yeah, yeah. So I, I talked with Vince just last week about the photos this year. Fortunately, there is a much, much bigger crew this year. And uh, and in ways that I don't know how much I can say about it, but we'll all find out in a few weeks. 
uh, it's it's really fortunate how much the Blue Scooty story blew up and how many opportunities it sounds like it's allowed the CTWC to land. Yeah. Last year, I was basically the only photographer on staff, which was kind of insane. Uh, there's just way too much stuff to photograph. <laughs> so ahead of time, I was just you know working with talking with Chris Higgins uh, about the headshot setup. We wanted to improve it over the previous years by having dedicated lights. And in that one specific area, having the rest of the room be dark actually helped. Yeah. Because it meant that there wasn't a lot of extra light just flooding in. We could just have the two lights on either side illuminating the players. And they were well isolated from the background. Elsewhere, yeah, it was just a matter of, you know, again, you know, knowing all my camera settings and trying to balance them as well as possible. This year, fortunately, my only role uh officially is to do the headshots there's going to be uh other people taking care of all the other stuff so i'll just be filling in the gaps wherever yeah i can so that's the way it was always in the past uh oftentimes you'd have a dedicated headshot person then somebody running around taking all the general photos yeah it's very hard to do both at once yeah because in 2022 i think we cwc had like two photographers uh, one for the headshots uh, and and one for running around. Uh, I believe yeah, in, that it... in 2022, Dan Billups, who was the cinematographer for Ecstasy of Order way back in the day, was taking the headshots. And then Dan Sushi, who runs all of the New York City local Tetris meetups, uh, was was uh, he actually volunteered to do the photography because he works in the camera industry and. He did probably the best coverage, I think, of any CTWC there's ever been. He was just a pro at going everywhere and just <laughs> taking thousands of photos. And uh, he, he was a real inspiration for me to try and just get even close to that level yeah. in 2023. I think, you, I think you did, because I feel like when I look back at photos of 2022 and look back at photos of 2023, and now with the knowledge that you were the only one, like I think you covered a lot of of CTWC those three days. Yeah, yeah, I'm 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 really happy with how the the photos turned out, and I'm also grateful that Eric was able to jump in. You know, it was the one silver lining of him going out early in the tournament. <laughs> yeah, we we weren't expecting him to be able to take photos for much of the weekend because he was going to be on a deep run. But then when he had that early exit, of course, his passion right now is in video production, and filmmaking, and photography, and he's really good at it. So. He was able to tag team with me on a lot of stuff, but yeah, it's uh, I, I I am happy with how much I was able to cover. In the end. <laughs> so now CWC twenty twenty four, it will be in a couple of weeks, uh, June seven to nine in Pasadena, California. How excited are you for the move from Portland to Pasadena? Oh my gosh, um, you know it's one of those things where I feel like. I don't quite know what to expect. I've never been to this venue in Pasadena. I was very familiar with the Portland location. And I think a lot of the reasons that the move was made are moves that benefit CTWC uh, it, internally that you know maybe the public won't know about. Then we'll only find out once we get there. Like I would, I would guess that a major reason for this move is the uh, amount of I don't know the the layout the 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 stuff that's available. Yeah, um, it was just on on an organization expo level. I mean, the the biggest thing by far is just outside of the location is just all the new attention coming from the Blue Scooty press. There's just going to be a lot more crew, a lot more media there. It's just going to be wild. Yeah. So I'm I'm definitely I'm really looking forward to that. It's it's a good time to move i think then i don't know how it will be and i think first year is always challenging in at a new location so and the move to pasadena was not was mixed uh uh uh, had mixed feelings about like um american college or uh, college students and high school students they could attend but in europe most students are in their finals so it's like trying to find that worldwide balance that that's that's difficult but also like going to a new location and then hearing that okay yeah but Pasadena is right where uh Finns lives in in the LA area and so 
mixed emotions about moving to uh, Pasadena generally, but I feel like, okay, it's an important year, like 35th year of NES Tetris, 15th edition of CTWC, 40th year of Tetris, and the Blue Scooter Game Crash earlier this year, and LXT 60 million score, and potential rebirth before CTWC. It's like a lot is, is coming, and the pressure is on. Oh my gosh, yes. I, I feel like this will be the most pivotal year in CTWC history. I, I hesitate to say the most important because it feels like, you know, nothing can outdo like the first year or something like that because, you know, it's what started everything. But as far as just like a crossroads, you know, this this feels like the biggest chance CTWC has ever had to make a real splash on the mainstream world. You yeah. know, they, we, in a way we haven't seen since Jonas versus Joseph. And in many ways, this has m- become much bigger than that. So I'm, I'm really a fingers crossed that, you know, it's it's a great year and everything goes well and that we, we get to see a great tournament because th- this could be the year we look back on as the, the year that everything blew up. Once again. <laughs> yeah. We will return to the conversation the first. We moved homes on YouTube. We are now on a classic Tetris Monthly YouTube channel where all our episodes will be available at full length. Join the classic Tetris Monthly Discord server. Go to ctm.gg slash discord to join the server and participate in one of our monthly tournaments and join the biggest classic Tetris Discord server. If you have a suggestion we need to have on the next piece of fantasy podcast, let us know through the socials or on our Discord. Pizza Pendency Podcast is also available on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. There is also a Peace Dependency YouTube channel. On this channel, you see podcast highlights, mini documentaries, and other NES Tetris related topic videos. You can follow us on the socials at Peace Dependency, and we are active on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Now, let's go back to the conversation. I mean, since. I truly believe that since 2018, nearly every year there is a blow up in 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 our community, in our sports, in our game. It's like every year there's something that is happening. Yeah, yeah. Although I mean, this year is different in so many ways. I think the biggest thing that's just always kind of it's it's been the dream in the back of our minds, but just like general press caring about classic Tetris because, you know, it's always just been this kind of like feels like a niche thing that we yeah. care about a lot and some people casually view, but there's not like, you know, worldwide attention on it. And now there is like the top Tetris players are getting thousands of live viewers. That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> like that's a pro streamer levels. <laughs> it's to me, I find it scary in a way, like when the Blue Skitty game crash happened and then after your viral video, I mean, I got texts from people from my work. They know I do the podcast and they know I, I'm in the community, but they don't care generally. But I got texts from everyone like, did you see that? Yeah, of course, I was. I saw I saw it live, but, <laughs> but it's like everyone is texting me now over over Tetris about Tetris. And it was like. This is weird because it's my hobby. It's it's your hobby. It's what we love to do day in day out, contributing to the community in in our way. And like now, national news in the Netherlands is talking about it. Geek sites uh, are talking about it. I see it all over Instagram. I see it. I made a post like I I googled um, uh, public news in Australia in in. Uh, Turkey and Russia, whatever, and everyone was talking about the Blue Scooter Game Press uh, back in January. Yeah, we we had never seen anything like it, and uh, I mean, that was one of the most surreal weeks of my life. <laughs> I, I don't know <laughs> how many things can can top that as far as just like this is just weird and wild. But yeah, uh, I think the the most. Uh, 
the the most like terrifying thing when I think back of just like butter in a butterfly effect way of just like oh if only one thing had gone differently maybe none of this would have happened uh, is the fact that it all comes down to what makes a good headline oftentimes because small think, as we talked about earlier small ants uh you know you can have a great story that's amazing but, but unless there's some way to get people to just immediately understand the context and the significance very quickly then most people might never click on and so that's where i look at like again older videos it's like maybe i told the story well yeah but if i didn't get a lot of people just invested right away then i've just missed out on so much growth that could happen yeah and that was an opportunity where I realized how much I still had to learn because I thought I had optimized the title and thumbnail for that video so well. I thought through every angle, I was like, all right, how can I hype up Game Crash? Well, I, maybe the angle is the curiosity gap is can this world record ever be beaten it, it, because it sounds perfect. Read yeah. the Game Crash and I would explain how it could be beaten. So that was the original title of the video was is the latest classic tetris world record unbeatable and then small Ange watched it on his twitch page and said <laughs> uh, you know youtuber to youtuber i have a much better title in mind you should really consider it and then because i i didn't know who he was at the time the only way i found out was one of his fans left a youtube comment on my video and i saw it yeah and then i went back to his vod and saw it and decided to change it and then it was just instant the click through rate doubled the views just skyrocketed and he was totally right i had even said it in the video itself like eight minutes in i was like one way you could look at this is that you know instead of the player the game beating the player the player had finally beaten the game yeah and it was just you know him and his youtube experience and knowing how to sell a story he was like you you hit it right there that that should be the title you know <laughs> make it the title and that was the moment for me where um, I was like, okay, I watched Small Land for four or five years, even before I got into any Etcetras, I, I watched him. And it was like, this is such a weird cross crossover that I'm experiencing right now. I had the same with t uh, when Rob Scallon was... Uh, uh, answering to your rolling video and it says I, I'm watching Rob for 10 years when he was making whatever, whatever video and it's like those weird crossovers like okay they watch this it's to me it's my game like it's my community do your Mario stuff let me let me have the Tetris and then boom and it's worldwide news that's that's the what if, but the other what if to me is Eric also made a uh, Blue Scooty Game Crest video, and he had it done before you were done with the edit, and he he said, "Okay, I'm going to sleep. Uh, uh, let it render." And you were like, I "Don't think if you uploaded it directly, or maybe you had an all nighter and uh, uploaded it at a normal time." But it's like if Eric uploaded it earlier maybe his video would have gone viral uh, and and or or not or you know it's uh, so many things so many what is but i feel like all all the puzzles are falling right in into the right places right now yeah that was that was a really <laughs> a really funny coincidence cuz i don't think that's ever happened uh elsewhere in the classic tetris scene where two uh, two of us making content have come up with the same it's the same video topic the exact same day and uh i we we were both we were both racing to get that video out because we knew how great of a topic it was yeah and for me yeah i look back on that week and uh, <laughs> in a ways it was kind of the content creator version of the fractal and scooty race to get the first game crash. yeah yeah so um, yeah so december 21st blue scooty with the game crash weird rumbling scooting and fractal both 
uh, wanting that that first game crash. Uh, did you watch that live, the the Scooter game crash? I did not. I I heard about it from a ping on Beepo Monk actually, <laughs> and my my first reaction was mixed feelings. I was very excited about it, but I also was like, oh no. I'm going to have to completely scrap the current video I'm working on. Well, what's the video you're working on? I had a video that on? was in production. It was already, it was about Gerald's uh, paused world record where he had made it to charcoal for the first time, which was, which was a whole rabbit hole of its own because <laughs> there was a pause debate in the CTM discord. And I was like, oh, this is an interesting game. And I, I thought maybe this would be the only way that people would ever get super far is if they did paused runs. Yeah. And so I made a whole I made a whole script for that. I filmed it. I started editing it. And then Pixelandy got to charcoal for real. And I was like, oh shoot. All right. I gotta add in a section about Pixelandy getting a charcoal for real. But this still works. And then Fractal started getting going for game crash and then Scooty did too. And then they just started, you know, going back and forth. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is good. I, I'm gonna have to redo the whole ending of this video. And then Scooty got the game crash. And then I just looked at that and I was like, okay. You know. The entire focus has needs to change. Like this, uh, you know, I, I just have to start from scratch. And I need to do it now and I need to do it quickly. Because at the time, be, since I launched a Patreon, I had an internal goal of I wanted to get a video up every single month. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to go one month without having something up for the people who had donated. And that was already December 21st. And I was uh you know, I was about to go to my fiance's house for Christmas for a few days. Uh, you know, I was only going to have less than a week after getting back from that in yeah. order to make the video. So I got back and yeah, it was just five days of, uh, you know, eating, sleeping, going to work and working on that video. Uh, just kind of a flow state of, I don't know how I pulled that off. Uh, especially since I was doing a lot of original research during that time, going yeah. through the Discord servers and finding the crash doc and everything. I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I like fudged a detail or two with the explanation of the crash, which is one thing I wish I had gotten uh, just a little bit more right. But I, I managed to get at least most things uh, correct with with that. So uh, <laughs> I'm grateful for that. But but you, you yeah. Going you're going that to that final day <laughs> yeah but but let's back up you go you know scooter has a game crash you know you go to uh -huh. your to the parents of Junior, your fiance for christmas like what is going through in your mind like are you um scrolling on discord on mobile maybe taking notes or are you completely completely off for the video and everything happens in those five days Internally, yes, I, w I was thinking about how to do the video um, <laughs> while, while we were, you know, opening presents and stuff. I was still present uh, in the moment. But yes, and I think what's funny is because of the super time crunch I had in mind, because I was like, all right, my deadline's December 31st. I got to get the video out by then. I, I, I think that helped me. And like, I was like, all right, I need to tell the story as efficiently as possible. I can't waste time on extraneous details, which I think ended up making the final video a lot better. Uh, you know, I wasn't wasting time on stuff I didn't need to focus on. It's very, very fast paced. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, from there, it was just like, all right, shoot, got to research, got a script right, did it in a day and a half, just start, start editing, throw, throw, throw stuff together. And the final day, I got home from work at about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And I was like, the video has to be up tomorrow. I worked on it until I think the moment it went up the next morning at like nine or ten a.m. Cool. Um, so it and was... that was, I guess, right at the moment where Eric um, was also finishing up his video, and so I pulled an all-nighter that night and got it up. Yeah. And Eric decided to go to bed in the middle of the night, and that was the difference between who uploaded the video first. <laughs> oh my! Yeah. Because, because I, I I heard it like uh, in 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 the content creation the Discord server both the fuss like uh, uh, with the Scooter Game Crest and then 
there's always like who's doing what okay no one wants to step on each other's toes but this is there was something so unique that okay we can have multiple videos about it shocky always is the best it's it's a pie you can have multiple pies uh, pie slices or, or something like that and uh, uh for example now with uh the perfect max from noah or uh, alexi 60 million we have so many um great content creators who put their own style to it and and make the same subject unique to them uh, in a way but that i feel like the eric video and your video are pretty similar because it had to be yeah i think that that's one situation where what i would hope for is that the scene grows to the point where multiple people are able to make videos about the same topic and we all do it in our own way and all the videos pop off because that i mean i mean as you said people will take different angles people will have different ways that they would approach it in the past i used to have this attitude where i was like oh man if somebody else makes a video about something then maybe i don't want to make it anymore because i feel like it's already been made there's no point to it but i think over time yeah what i realized is you know i've seen really great breakdowns for multiple different people yeah uh summoning salt just uploaded his video about you know the entire history of nes tetris covering a lot of the same ground i have in many videos and it was really really cool to see how he did it yeah and the fact that his video is out there I don't feel like he's a rival in the content creator space. He's an ally. We're all trying to blow this up together. Yeah. And so I was really, I, I was really happy for Eric at least. Uh, Cause I, I felt like a little bad that uh, <laughs> what, what, you know, my, my video was blowing up like insane yeah. and his video was too, but just, you know, not to the same level, but it, it did end up being his most successful video ever. And so we, we did talk about like, cause we both had the same idea or the next video, which was basically explaining the path to rebirth and yeah. crash dodge. Um, and so we did talk privately because I was like, oh my gosh, you know, if we're both making the exact same video, uh, you know, we'll be, we'll basically be in a race again to, you know, get it out. And, and so I said, you know what? I actually, Eric, I'll focus on something else. I want to see how you did do this. And when he came out with the video, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so much better than that was I such a done. cool video because. Yeah, because he just he has that knowledge of how to do the ROM hacks. He uh, and to show all those examples on the CRT itself. That was so cool. Yeah. And so there, there's been no video topic that I've been more happy to step aside for than that one, because, yeah, I think it's it'll be the guide that I'll be able to point to for people for months to come. On yeah. So how you worked uh, with Summoning Soul on the the world tetris records history video how did that came about so uh i mean how it came out is uh he sent me a friend request on discord and, and just uh told me that you know he was thinking about doing a history of nes tetris for his next video but he wanted to be to be a secret because all of his videos are, are are a secret um at least for the communities they're about. Yeah. Uh, that way he doesn't get like bombarded by everybody ahead of time. <laughs> um, so yeah, he, he, he reached out to me and he reached out to a few other uh, people uh, in the community. He, he just tried, tried to keep the group as, as small as possible. But uh, I mean, the, the people are in there, you know, Fractal and Eric and Nerd the Box who put together the whole world record history sheet. And then Qatar, who's, of course, a legend of the scene, has been around for many years and was the person who helped the most in the research, <laughs> um, just in terms of the raw messages, yeah. especially from old info from back in the day. But yeah, that, that was basically the process. Um, he reached out to us and then he'd have a chat where he would be doing his own research, doing the exact same thing I was, back reading CTM, learning cool. how to navigate all the different channels and stuff. And then just asking us for pointers whenever he came across something he didn't quite know the context to. So he had to join on an alt because if summoning salt is 
like his main account joining <laughs> with his main account on CTM, <laughs> people know what is up. <laughs> Yes, yes. So he had an alt and he was doing research uh, in CTM on, on his alt for several months. But now finally, now that that first Tetris video is out, he doesn't have to hide anymore. He joined on his real account. Yeah, I saw him. I've been on di off Discord lately, uh, but I saw some of the last. Sometimes it's crazy how how it, it went. Like uh, also with now Blue's Cootie getting sponsored by uh, the Flag Brothers, after they've been watching CDWC, or John has been watching CDWC for many years now, it's so cool to let uh, them give back to to the community right now. And it's 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 amazing that we came from a niche game, and might still be niche, but it's like we're we're knocking on mainstream. Yeah, I think it's the uh, the Blue Scooty media storm. I think it finally resulted in a lot of people looking at the classic Tetris scene more seriously, and also people who had been watching more casually for many years finally having a, a reason to come join the community further, or they had something they could contribute. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm really grateful to John and Hank Green, because it sounds like it was, it was Hank Green's idea to do the sponsorship after John Green had been doing, uh, you know, just been a fan for so many years. So I'm grateful they were in a position to have a company that made sense to do the sponsorship with. Yeah. So it's just really cool seeing all that kinds of stuff come together. But I think the biggest question from the Blue Scooty video crash video is, what happened to Gerald's video? What happened to Gerald's video? Well, basically, it it now exists uh for <laughs> for people on my patreon page i did put up the whole original script there so people can read it there if they want but yeah i think it will be revisited if the pause debate comes up if somebody tries to do a pause rebirth i hope they don't because that would mean a lot of controversy yeah uh, just do it normally the first time but, but yeah <laughs> baby pause I mean, there's rebirth. so many videos that i've written scripts for yeah <laughs> go ahead Maybe Sorry. let's maybe let's do a pause rebirth after the first rebirth. Yes, yes, and, and I I hope Gerald can do some major achievement someday that uh, I, I I can do a whole video of focusing on um, again. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there's the the nature of classic Tetris over the years has been there's been so many videos where I've gone to various stages of production with them and then I've just had to put them aside because I either didn't get around to doing them in time for them to be super relevant, or I just had other video ideas that seemed to make more sense to do yeah. next. So a team in 2024 has been that you, we know or suspect that you're working on a video. Um, Pixel Andy's world record earlier this year, uh, LXT's uh, record, and then you're editing it and they break the record while you're editing and they break the record again while you're editing and make for a very funny memes in the uh, CTM discord servers and like let me finish the video before <laughs> before you get a new record but it's like is how hard is it that you made a script and starting maybe uh recording uh facials and maybe recording uh lines and then you have to rewrite a part of the script or maybe rewrite the whole script. Yeah, there is a, it's, it's always a fear <laughs> when uh, I uh, am working on a video that is timely and could be made obsolete, uh, uh, like what happens, yeah, with the Gerald video. And yeah, I just have to be kind of flexible and adapt. And sometimes it ends up working out. Like the Alex T video, video uh initially that was actually another example where i changed the title and thumbnail shortly after upload and i only was able to do it after alex t broke all those records while i was in the middle of making the video <laughs> so i had the video all scripted out and he just kept breaking records and i was like oh no this is gonna make this all invalid but it actually really worked out in the end because one of the things i was most concerned about is how i was going to approach the whole jim versus original cart debate yeah. i thought audiences would not be on board with jim but 
And, and so my only hope was to like, I was like, all right, I will try and hype up his achievements so much and, you know, not exaggerating anything, but just kind of like showing how difficult it was. Yeah. Showing the magnitude of how hard it was to get that far. Uh, and that that would be a compelling enough reason for audiences to accept his record. And then when he just broke all of them, it was just like, oh, well, you know, I, I'll may I'll still make the case for his uh, 16 million, but no matter what you care about, he has all the records. Yeah. So it totally, you know, it's the best possible ending. I may be much more confident in that ending. And then I uploaded the video with the original planned title, which was just a kind of boring rehash of what had worked for me previously with the pixel Andy video of just like Tetris roll record just got destroyed again. I was like, uh, you know, maybe that'll work. And then it was doing very mediocre in the first couple hours. And then I just sort of had the epiphany moment of like, Oh, I, I figured out the right title. It was right in the first five seconds. Yeah. Uh, you know, 15 year old just broke every Tetris world record. You know, just go for it in the title. And that's kind of what I realized is like the art of YouTube titles is just you have to phrase them in a way that's simple enough that, you know, it accurately reflects what happened, even if it's not like 100% accurate. Yeah. It's like, obviously, he didn't break every Tetris world record. He didn't break the no rotation or no push down points or whatever. But, you know, for the purposes of like the score and lines world record, he did break all of them. So yeah. it was like, it was accurate enough and it gave you the context in like five seconds to understand the magnitude of it. And after that, the video started doing way better and then it just completely blew up from there. Is that is that what you trying to achieve for the coming videos? Like those first five seconds, it, that has to be D. Like if you don't like a video, you click away within five seconds. Yes, 100%. And that was one thing that I realized uh, again, over time about YouTube is that there is some conventional wisdom that you could figure out just doing it over time. It's like, okay, the first minute is really important. Uh, the first 30 seconds are really important. The first 20 seconds are really important. It just kind of slowly became the, this, you know, uh, you know, it, you, you need to get the audience's attention faster and faster. And then I watched a video talking about how Mr. Beast does videos and, you know, Watching big YouTubers, especially the biggest ones like Mr. Beast, even if you don't exactly do everything they do, they have entire teams researching every possible YouTube strategy and optimizing it to perfection. So if you look at what they're doing, the team has crunched the numbers and have figured out this is the right way to do things. Yeah. And for Mr. Beast, the way he put it in a podcast interview is he said, first, uh, your first shot has to match your thumbnail. And your first sentence has to match your title. Yeah. And that's the way to engage an audience. That's like as close to the beginning as you can possibly get, you know, <laughs> not even the first minute, first 30 seconds, first 20 seconds. Yeah. That's the first five seconds, your first yeah. shot and your first sentence. And it's like, ah, oh, it makes so much sense, uh, you know, because you want people to instantly know that they're getting what was promised. Yeah. And so that's where, again, like with the Alex T video, it's like the title is a 15 year old breaks every Tetris roll record. And then the very first thing you see in the first five seconds is a 15 year olds on screen. He's playing Tetris and he says, I'm going to break every Tetris roll record. And then I quickly say, yep, sure enough, he did. <laughs> <laughs> so then it's off to the races from there. So with everything that you do for the past five, years right now with you trying to upload monthly videos and they, they have a lot of research or try to uh, have a lot of various topics within NES Tetris and the all-nighters that you have to pull and all that. How important is it that you have someone next to you like Yunya that uh, she knows and she understands like what is what is what is happening as a NES Tetris YouTuber? Yeah, you know, it's been really great to have Una alongside. And I, I'm really grateful for her understanding a lot of the times. Because uh, one of the things, unfortunately, I, I realized when uh, over the past couple of years of understanding YouTube better, uh, you know, learning the best practices of the top YouTubers. And oftentimes the most successful YouTubers, they don't have a healthy work-life balance. Because in, you know... 
in the YouTube land, you know, you create all your own hours. So you can take time off whenever you want. But any time you take off is leaving time on the table that you could have gotten the next video out faster or yeah. anything. So that's where you see a lot of the top YouTubers, they burn out because there's no incentive to take any breaks. You are always incentivized for just working harder, working faster and working, you know, just as fast as you possibly can. And even looking back at it, like it's hard for me to regret, you know, me just going crazy for five days to make that blue scooty video. Uh, and, and you do doing nothing else in my life <laughs> that's outside of work and uh, sleep. Um, but you know, it's like, yeah, I was, I may, may be miserable on the final day in the middle of that all nighter, but do I regret that? Not for anything in the world. <laughs> so <laughs> it's tough to know, uh, you know, where to put in the full efforts and where to scale things back. And so yeah. I think Una has been a really great um, person, both supporting me when I've been making these big pushes and also being the voice on the side to tell me when I can take a step back a bit. Yeah. And, you know, I don't need to pull all I need to spend, uh, you know, an an another day trying to cancel everything, you know, to get the next video out yeah. and maintain a healthier work-life balance. And does it help also in a way that she's trying to do her own thing, like now with Tetris Gal talk, uh, or maybe Dr. Mario talk <laughs> lately with the Dr. Mario interviews, but like she's trying to understand the process of working on a video idea, working on an interview, working on the editing and, 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 and all that. So like what you're going through in a, in a lesser extent. Yeah, Una's own videos with Tetris Gal Talk has been a really cool way for us to connect. And yes, uh, absolutely, for us to both understand each other better. I started out basically doing all the editing for Una on Tetris Gal Talk, um, just because I wanted her to have, uh, you know, the, the videos come out and, and do well right off the bat. And I was teaching her, but, you know, it was basically, I, I was you know, helping every single step of the process. Um, and so it was just kind of like every time she would put out a new episode, I would kind of back off just a tiny little bit. Um, and I think that, you know, that that's what I wanted is what she wanted to, because she wanted to be able to do it by herself. And then by the time she got around to doing the Dr. Mario episodes recently, she interviewed the Dr. Mario gals. She reached the point where, I didn't have basically any involvement at that point. She had figured out how to do it entirely by herself, which was awesome because she basically, yeah, she learned how to edit and she does a great job in editing them. And yeah, I think there there is now a mutual understanding of us because, you know, there were a few days where she would stay up all night, you know, <laughs> editing that Blue Scooty's mom interview because we both knew how timely that one was. Yeah. I have fireworks near me. <laughs> yeah, it's like I remember when uh, Junior was interviewing my wife, Mrs. Mason. Like we both, we were both setting up uh, the camera, the Discord call, the mic, and all that. And and after the interview was done, and I know my wife was calling me. Okay, we're done. And, and Junior was calling you. We're done. It's like how how that evolved that that's very cool to see and i i love that how she's evolved uh uh with you like not being your significant other but also trying to help now the dr mario community but also uh help the the gals in the tetris community further yeah for sure we had a lot of conversations about that because the first couple uh, regionals that we attended after things opened up after the pandemic. And this would have been after we had our previous podcast together, my previous appearance on the Peace Dependency podcast. Yeah, Una would show up to events and she'd either be like the only girl there or there would be like one or two other girls and that's it. And sometimes she felt, you know, not that people were rude to her, but like they didn't approach her or they didn't think of her as a player. Um, or just like assume like when she was waiting in line, like maybe someone would get in front of her because they didn't think that, oh, you know, she's in line for it uh, because she's a girl and girls don't play Tetris. And so she really wanted to show that not only 
you know, even though there's very few women in the community, that they do exist, and that if they do show up, they they will have, uh, you know, fellow women there participating right alongside with them. So a big part of that effort was, yeah, Una wanting to make Tetris Gal talk and highlight the women in classic Tetris. And she was the right person to do it because it was like, you know, it, it didn't feel as authentic if like I were to do something like that because I'm a guy, you know, it feels more authentic if it comes from somebody who actually you know, understands that life experience uh, yeah. being a woman. So I, uh, yeah, I couldn't be more proud of everything Una's done. And, you know, she's involved so much more now than just being, you know, representing women. She does social media now for CTWC. She's going to be on the social media team running the Instagram accounts and stuff. And it's going to be a big job this year with how yeah. much stuff is going on for the prep. Yeah. Yeah, and last year I thought that she, along with uh, the wife of uh, Pump Your Heart, helped with uh, uh, registration. Yes, yes, yeah. That was a, that was a case where yeah, it was all hands on deck because there was a big staff turnover with you know uh, Adam and Trey retiring and a couple other volunteers being unable to return for various reasons. It kind of took uh, er everybody in the community in different ways stepping up and volunteering to fill all of the gaps. And yeah, it was it, it it turned out really well last year. It was a it was a whole team effort. Is that a part of the story that you uh wanna tell if you're gonna do the twenty twenty three review uh, video? Oh, a hundred percent, yeah. So the twenty twenty three video is not gonna come out before twenty twenty four. Uh I originally was hoping that it would, but Circumstances change things, uh, basically. Uh, you know, uh, not only was there just seven months in between this last year's CTWC and this C CTWC, I also had that kind of, uh, and just also like the world records. Uh, yeah. You know, after Blue Scooty Mania, there was like big videos that had to come out, you know, the Pixel Andy video, the, um, the Alex T video, and I wanted to do as much work on them as possible and the videos that I have coming next uh, like also need to come out as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah. But also I realized that for several months, the angle that I was thinking of going about the CTWC 2023 video was probably the wrong angle to do. Um, because I realized that with the CTWC 2022 video, I made it very much in mind of like my experience uh, and, and again, I feel like my story as a player is basically over at this point. Yeah. You know, I came in as a fan, I wanted to participate in CTWC and eventually I did, I made the silver bracket. I got to play a match in person, you know, and if I do nothing else, I'm satisfied. My story is over. Now it's the story of everybody else. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and in many ways I've, I've had talks with other content creators like Eric, you know, I think Eric is in that same sort of state of where like, you know, he came in as a fan, as a player, and you know, he eventually won the world championships. You know, it was beyond his wildest dreams. Uh, but you know, the competition nowadays is going to make that almost impossible to do again. So yeah. he's totally satisfied and happy taking on a different role in the community now, um, as one of the photographers, as one of the videographers, uh, as one of the event organizers. Like he went to the Boston Tea Parody event that Fractal did. Uh, and I barely saw him on the stream at all. He wasn't <laughs> playing. He was behind the scenes yeah. filming the entire time. Uh, but that's awesome. I'm looking forward to what he films for that. Uh, and so, yeah, to tie it back to the CCWC 2023 video, I realized basically the angle that I wanted to take uh, was I, I, I needed to change it up. Uh, because, again, it's, it's all about that that way to you know, convey the significance yeah. of a year uh, in a single sentence, in a single picture, in a single five seconds shot at the beginning and, you know, any, anything. It, it's, it's very tough because I, I now am second guessing myself constantly now that I know how important all that stuff is. I'm yeah. like, oh my gosh, you know, if I don't get the title or the thumbnail or the intro right, this could be the difference between 30,000 and you know, 3 million views. <laughs> um, uh, I, 
I have a different angle that I want to take with the CTWC 2023 video. Um, and I think it will be better to do it after 2024 happens. So I'll be but waiting until then to do it. Won't it be difficult to not include 2024, Dan? So, yeah, so the, um, the, the cool thing is that there, there's a lot of things that become different in retrospect in ways that I never would have anticipated. So basically, um, uh, like, like for, like for one example, um, I, I'll say like, like one, one very small thing that will be in the CTWC 2023 video. Uh, was that we, as as the photographer, I needed to take photos of like specific things. And there's there's one moment where like Vince asked me like, oh, you know, we, we just need a photo of a, a player and they need to be holding a bunch of stuff. And, uh, you know, all, all of our sponsor items. Yeah. Um, and so Blue Scooty was there. And we're like, all right, Blue Scooty, get in here. Just stand in front of all the stuff, hold all the Tetris things. Uh, we'll take a, uh, take a shot uh, of you. That photo ended up being the most widely distributed photo I've ever taken of anything because Scooty became world famous two yeah. months later yeah. and people wanted a photo of him. And I had a photo of him standing in front of a whole bunch of Tetris things, ha holding a bunch of Tetris stuff. That's the photo that you see on most news outlets, most everywhere, you know, in the New York Times, Associated Press, everywhere. And it's so funny to me that it's like, yeah, just the fortuitous chance that Blue Scooty was the player that was there and was the player that I took a photo of holding all that stuff. Yeah. And that ended up being uh, as moment. That's a very, very small thing, but it's like, that's where it's like, oh, something very small in the moment can have a totally different context once you find out what happens next. So the angle that I want to take with CTWC 2023, I think will be able to put into further context with CTWC 2024, with just the little that I know about how insane it's going to be. Yeah. The style and the narration that you have for the Scooty video and for the Alex T video and for the Andy video, is that the same style you want to achieve for all the videos you have left for in, in 2024? To some degree, yes. Um, because it's sort of what I've realized is like, once you have a super outlier video on YouTube, that's where most of your subscribers are coming from. And that's what they're going to want to see. That's what they're familiar with in the same way I made a pie song, you know, so many years ago on my other channel. And all my subscribers from that video didn't really get what they were subscribing for because there weren't more pie songs. And so with this, it's kind of trying to figure out how to do video ideas that I had in the past in the same sort of style of the blue scooty video underneath the hood. Maybe they aren't like the exact thing on the surface. Like, of course there's not going to be a major world record that I'm going to be able to talk about in every single video. Uh, Cause there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about. That's not major world records, but it's the approach of, yeah, trying to figure out just on a very sort of, fundamental level what worked about that video the other videos i've been working on that have done well recently and just trying to keep that momentum going uh so yeah that, that basically required me think rethinking entirely how i was going to do this ctwc 2023 video uh from even just stuff as simple as uh i'm not going to include a travel montage at the beginning uh the watch time just goes uh, during that section for casual viewers, even though I personally like it. And it feels like, you know, just a very familiar part of the edit of like, that's got to go. Uh, you know, it's just, it's killing their attention. Um, so it's just, uh, you know, a ton, a ton of micro decisions like that of like, all right, evaluate what worked and what didn't in previous videos and just build the future videos off of that, even at the expense of the way you think things should be in your mind. You have to just take your personal biases aside and make the video the best way it can be. Uh, Game Scott, thanks so much for joining me on the Pizza Penalty Podcast for this month. It was a truly pleasure to talk to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for continuing to do these, Sir Mazer. I'm so glad that these exist as a thing. 
I listen to them when I'm doing commutes sometimes for long work trips. And it's the, the perfect way to really dive into just getting to know these players so much more. So I'm glad this is a thing that exists. And thank you again for having me on. And with that all being said, this will be the end of the Pizza Penises podcast. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening this full season here on the Monthly Tetris YouTube channel or wherever you get your favorite podcast. We'll be back in September for Series 5 of PDP. Hope you have a great summer and I'll see you in September. Bye!